Coming off the success of their first entry in the Need for Speed series with Hot Pursuit 2, Black Box was promoted to the head development studio for subsequent console versions of the game. Not only was this a major change for EA, as EA Seattle, the originators of the Need for Speed franchise, were now no longer at the helm of development, but there was just as big of a change happening within car culture itself of the early 2000s. This was a result of a small film that you may or may not have heard of called The Fast and the Furious, which hit theaters in July of 2001, just before the release of Hot Pursuit 2 that October. And the zeitgeist following the movie created an entirely new generation of car people and saw drivers at the time have a fascination around JDM cars and car customization as well. It was now cool to take your average grocery getter like a Honda Civic and cram air intakes, body kits, wheels, and of course nitrous oxide under the hood to make something completely different than what you started with. The impact this film had on the car scene in the US can't be understated, and I'll leave links below to a wonderful Moto Trend article discussing this with some of the cast members and companies that supported the movie's production. Black Box would also take notice of this impact brought on by Paul Walker and gang, and would begin to use its power as the head developer for the Need for Speed series to change direction. In May of 2003, EA and Black Box announced Need for Speed Underground to the public. Gone were the exotic supercars from manufacturers like Ferrari and Lamborghini, as too were the long winding tracks in favor of tight city streets with tuned up JDM cars from brands like Nissan and Toyota. Going back to some old forum posts I found on a website called Neoseeker, fans at the time were mixed on the upcoming changes. Some lamented the loss of their favorite supercars, and also brought up a great point that in 2003, manufacturers had some amazing cars in the works like the Ferrari Enzo and Saline S7, which also has me fantasizing about a version of Hot Pursuit with mid-2000 supercars. Others were incredibly excited to see where Black Box would take the franchise with the inspiration from the Fast and the Furious. The excitement swelled even further in another Neo Seeker thread when someone shared some early in-game screenshots via IGN of cars like the Toyota Supra and Celica racing in the streets of Olympic City. Each car model was elaborately and carefully detailed, paying close attention to making the added body kits look seamless between models. Fans were beyond impressed at both the graphical fidelity of what Black Box had done so far and the immense customization that they were going to allow players to immerse themselves in. Thankfully, the posters at the time wouldn't have too much longer to wait, as Black Box would release the game in November of 2003 and go on to change the future of the franchise for the next decade to come. Black Box sets the tone right off the bat with the game's intro video of a Mitsubishi Eclipse chasing down a Toyota Supra with its upgrades evolving as the race progresses, until the very end where it jumps a bridge into the start of the game. Compare this to Hot Pursuit 2's intro with a Lamborghini Murcielago and Ferrari 360 Spider being chased by police, and you'll see the most glaring omission in Underground, with a lack of law enforcement presence. This follows the player into both Underground mode as well as single and multiplayer, with no police presence whatsoever in the game. Some people have speculated over the years that this may be due to some manufacturers not wanting their cars featured in police chases during illegal street racing in a realistic city setting. But there's not enough solid information for me to give you a definitive answer. Although part of me says that that makes sense, the other part looks at a manufacturer like Ferrari who's notorious for upholding their brand image, allowing cars like the F50 or 360 to be hit with missiles from a police helicopter in hot pursuit while Honda wouldn't want a Civic Si being chased by a cop during a street race. Nevertheless, people were mixed on this massive change, but those feelings would begin to shift when starting the game on their own and diving into what Black Box had to offer. For single player content, Black Box came correct, offering the player with the traditional single player racing mode, as well as a brand new mode called Underground, which is where the true progression lies and where I had my very first experience playing the game. My brother and I had our initial playthrough at a family friend's house on the PS2. As a side note, that person actually had one of the cars in the game, a Mitsubishi Eclipse Turbo. In real life, black, tinted windows and exhaust. What a sick car. Anyway, back to the game itself though. We were hooked after the first few races, but quickly hit a skill gap wall at the game's first drag race. Later on in life, we would rent the game and learn how it plays to progress beyond that drag event before finally purchasing our own copy for the GameCube. Before you as the player can get started grinding through races, and I do mean grind, but more on that later, you are thrown into the world of the Olympic City underground racing scene in a circuit race driving a tuned up Acura Integra with an amazing wide body kit, 
engine modifications, vinyls, and of course, nitrous. After winning, you're snapped back to reality by the player's guide, Samantha, and get to choose so your starter car. Your car. Once you've chosen your ride and have been insulted by Samantha, Ouch, that is seriously weak, dude. The world of racing is opened up to you. Hey, loser. <laughs> Unlike the branching paths of Hot Pursuit, which either contained a single race or a six race tournament, Underground Mode offers the player 111 races to progress through, with around four or five races available at a time. Another change in Underground Mode over Hot Pursuit's progression is a small story spread between events. Your goal is to become the city champion, but to do that, you'll need to build up rep and take down racers along the way, including the Eastsiders and their leader, Eddie. You'll be drip-fed the trite start from the bottom and work your way up story through CGI cutscenes of the characters talking at you and short bursts of text before starting an event. As for gaining rep in Olympic City, that's done on the track by earning style points during a given race. Style points can be earned by performing power slides, near misses, jumps, and more. Then, at the end of an event, your points are added to a rep meter, which will reward you with more cars and customization unlocks as you progress further. The events feature some returning race types from Hot Pursuit, like Circuit, Point to Point, now called Sprint, and Lap Knockout races, while including two new and import tuner scene focus types in the aforementioned Drag Mode and Drift Mode. But before we get into those two new race types, remember how I alluded to a grind during all of these races? Well, it's one of the bigger negatives about Underground that you'll start to come across as you progress. Now, this isn't a grind like Hot Pursuit 2 or Midnight Club LA, where there's just a ton of several minute long races or five race tournaments that show up out of nowhere. This grind is arguably worse, as it's in the form of some pretty egregious rubber banding, where the AI racers will rocket up to you despite you hitting every apex perfectly and missing collisions with the unpredictable flow of traffic. This is seen best in the infamous event number 95 titled Kurt's Killer Ride, where you'll find yourself going up against one of Eddie's team members who shows up in an RX-7, which has the wonderful modification of the biggest rubber band in the world. This event is where many, myself included, will get stuck in during their playthroughs of the game. People eventually figured out that beyond just brute forcing with sheer willpower, that the performance of your opponent's cars actually scale up alongside yours. So by simply removing most, if not all of the modifications you've added, you can make this race more manageable. Anyway, back to those new modes I mentioned. We'll start with the American Classic and Drag Racing, which will have you and three other drivers racing in a short burst with manual shifting enabled by default. You can either have a good shift if you upshift when the rev indicator is blue, a perfect one if the indicator is green, a mist if it's white, or an over rev when it's red. Too many miss shifts and you'll be too slow and come in dead last. Too many over revs, or if you're seven, like me at the time, no shifts at all, and you'll blow the engine and need to start the race over. Once you get the hang of it, and you're not seven, you'll find it to be a pretty fun mode, with the difficulty coming and memorizing the traffic patterns on a given track, as it's what usually leads to the inevitable restarts. Changing lanes is a simple matter of tapping left or right on the joystick to change lanes, and while this sounds simple on paper, in practice, it adds to the traffic challenge, as a lane change too late will result in a total and the aforementioned restart of the event. One of the best parts of this mode to me is the incredible sense of speed that Black Box was able to portray. The sound of the rushing wind pushing against your car and the neon lights of surrounding city and racers become a blur the instant you hit the nitrous button in the car. Bonus points if you're playing on the GameCube like me, because the B button looks identical to the ones featured in the Fast and the Furious. And before you say it, I'm not a dork, I'm just getting into character. Drifting, on the other hand, is an entirely different beast from both drag and the more traditional races. No tap to change lane here or any semblance of grip. Enter the slickest surfaces you have ever driven on. So slick, in fact, that you can even enter drift events in a front-wheel drive car. You know, just like the real professional drifters use. All jokes aside, I'm not actually too bothered by this, as it makes each event much more accessible to younger gamers at the time, like myself, and at the time not having to worry about drivetrain layouts. We can save that job for Gran Turismo. Alongside this, the physics are not hyper-realistic, but provide a great sense of enjoyment when chaining drifts together to maximize your multiplier. And during a drift event, you'll find yourself performing a solo run on track, fighting against the scoreboard with your opponent's score constantly increasing, which pushes you to drive harder and get closer to the wall. Just be careful not to hit it, 
because not only will the score you've been building be lost, but the multiplier you've earned will go away as well. Black Box including this game mode was a brilliant idea, as the D1 GP series of drifting was beginning to take off in its home country of Japan, and was also starting to reach American shores by 2003 in California. Drift racing also fits the theming of fast, flashy Japanese cars with big wings and wild graphics, which is something that Underground would introduce to the Need for Speed franchise and redefine what gamers would expect from a racing game. Overall, the Underground Story Mode was a great change of pace from the previous entries in the Need for Speed series as a whole, especially from Hot Pursuit 2, which in my previous playthrough for the last video did start to drag on a bit. The Underground Mode provided a much needed structure and flow for the game progression. To me, this shows the major shift in design philosophy from Black Box for Need for Speed as it ushered in the move away from branching paths and single races to focusing the gameplay loop around a story which moves forward alongside the player's progression. You look like a dork. Is that supposed to impress me? A story-based progression and updated race roster is nothing if you don't have cars to drive with. And that brings us pretty nicely to the other change in direction from Black Box in the vehicle list. Like I shared before, Underground focuses on the illicit street racing scene introduced to the masses in The Fast and the Furious, which means it also brought a change in car manufacturers to more common Japanese brands like Nissan, Honda, Toyota, Mazda, Mitsubishi, as well as a few others like Dodge, Ford, and Volkswagen, and even Hyundai. While all of these brands may sound like ones you could have encountered on your morning commute, the models included are just as exotic and hard to find stateside, especially nowadays, as some of the ones in Hot Pursuit, with cars like the FD RX-7, Honda S2000, and my personal dream car, the Nissan Skyline GTR. All incredibly iconic JDM legends in their own right, with sound design that I feel does a good job of separating itself from the sports and exotic cars of the prior games. Although Underground's car list only contains 20 different vehicles compared to Hot Pursuit's 23, not including those Need for Speed editions, each model is fully customizable, from the wheels to the bumpers, paint, and even neon underglow. To go along with this, during your playthrough of the Underground mode, you're only able to have one car at a time, which helps the player avoid feeling the shortness of the cars at hand. While I would have loved to see Underground experiment with a garage for you to try other cars out, Black Box actually allows you to carry over all modifications made from one car to the next, with only needing to pay for the difference in the price of the car itself or earn some of the money back, which helps ease the money grind overall. On the topic of car modifications, Black Box has added an incredibly deep level of customization to each model, and they partner with many large parts manufacturers, such as Anke, BBS, G-Ready, AEM, Street Glow, NOS, and so many more. Utilizing these real-world brands helps to further connect Underground with the car culture at the time, and even lives up to the vision of creating the urban exotic car that a car person at the time would have wanted to build. Now while the game has a ton of parts and customization for you to throw at a given car, a bulk majority of them are locked until you've earned enough rep in Underground mode, and even further still aren't unlocked until you've purchased the parts, which is a bit of a bummer, because money can be a bit tight during the early game. What isn't a bummer though is the customized ride mode of the game, where once you've purchased and unlocked the parts, you can become your own performance shop and go wild on tailoring each car to your specific tastes. By today's standards, the customization is a bit basic, but in 2003 this was groundbreaking. The amount of visual customization for vinyls and paint colors alone is enough to keep you busy for hours, all while retaining the high graphical fidelity of each car model. One small downside of this mode though, is that each car can only have one given version of it at a time, but Black Box allows you to save a car's modification to be reapplied later if needed. Each car also gets a star rating based on the level and amounts of visual parts used, alongside the vinyl and paint jobs applied. A car can earn up to 5 stars total, and while it doesn't add much to the cars you build in Customize Ride, it does open up more opportunities in the underground mode with higher star ratings landing your car on the cover of Real World Magazine and DVD covers to encourage you to consistently modify and alter your builds. Beyond the standard 20 cars that can be customized, players can also unlock some unique versions of models via cheat codes to use during single and multiplayer races. I'm not going to count these as additional cars like the old Need for Speed editions from the last game, but they're worth mentioning as they tie in with some of the game's artists, such as P.D. Pablo and Rob Zombie. But speaking of the game's musical artists, Fallout 
Following the successful edition of licensed soundtracks to Hot Pursuit 2, we once again see licensed music from popular artists of the era return. Unlike the last game though, we see a major shift in the types of music, going from a majority of grunge and rock and a little bit of techno, to a heavy dose of rap, rock, and even more electronica on offer. Black Box did a wonderful job spacing out the genres too, with the bulk of the rap music to the main menu and the customized ride mode, with the now iconic Get Low by Lil Jon and the Eastside Boys, the runner up for the song that is definitely better censored than uncensored award, starting us off very strong. Beyond Lil Jon, we also have some great follow up with Keep It Coming by Nate Dogg, a very different song to the previous Keep It Coming by Uncle Cracker, and one of my personal favorites, 24s by T.I. So much of this menu music is ingrained into my brain from the hours of time I spent as a child customizing hundreds of cars, which adds to the addicting gameplay loop of building a car, racing it, and removing modifications to do it all over again. Beyond the changes to the music itself, the presentation of each song and genre has also changed completely from Hot Pursuit 2. Previously, during the Hot Pursuit modes of the game, Black Box had introduced the instrumental version of menu themes during racing, but for Underground, the menu music and racing music are separated by genre, with the previously mentioned rap being contained to the menus. While the main menu's rap tracks are forever locked into my subconscious, the guitar riffs from songs like Two Lane Blacktop by Rob Zombie are right behind them, and the beats from Doomsday by Overseer will never fail to add to the blur of the city as you battle it out for first place. And when the intro song of Kimosabe by BT comes on, oh man. Do I seriously get a bad case of main character syndrome and kick up the tryhard levels a few notches? On a side note, in my Hot Pursuit 2 video, I stated that the original soundtrack was only used for the EA Seattle version of the game when racing, and that wasn't the case entirely. Shout out to the comment section for correcting me and wanting me to dig deeper for this video, so I can mention that the soundtrack for Underground includes 10 original tracks, which, based on the names of the songs, sound like they were made to be used in Underground Mode's cutscenes. Black Box rewrote the rules for both the Need for Speed franchise and the entire genre of arcade racing games with Underground. While other games had aspects of customization and even JDM cars, such as the Tokyo Extreme Racer series, which really does deserve another look back, man do I love that game, Black Box and EA did it with one of the biggest racing franchises at the time. Much like the Fast and the Furious influencing car culture at the time, Underground would do the same in video games ushering in a new generation of racing games for years to come. While the rubber banding AI and small car roster do put some scratches on the rose tinted windshield of this Nissan Skyline, this cheesy story dialogue, absolutely amazing soundtrack, and of course, the hours I've spent customizing cars in my life help balance out those negatives. Now usually I like to end my retrospectives on a note of, should this game come back or does it hold up today? For Underground specifically, well, I'm a bit mixed on this now 20, god, again with the feeling old, year old game holding up or coming back. But that's not because this game is bad or boring, quite the opposite actually. The thing that's stopping me from showering underground in praise and getting on my hands and knees begging it to come back is the game that followed it up in the year to follow. But we'll save that for another time. Until then. We can pretend like it's 2003, where my channel is actually a Need for Speed Freewebs.com site, where I would absolutely recommend you give it a replay. And don't forget, take off those performance modifications at Event 95, and hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the form thr- <laughs> the next video.